Hello, may I welcome you on behalf of the MAN B&W diesel team. This video film is intended to inform you about essential servicing jobs on your diesel engines. A correct performance of these jobs is of great significance for trouble-free operation of these technically perfected engines. This video film comprehensively describes the jobs you need to carry out on inlet and exhaust valves. We'll be telling you all you need to know in two parts. In part one, we'll be looking at design features, working conditions and how to detect faults. You'll be shown what maintenance work you'll need to perform and how often you'll have to do it. As well as being shown checks that can be performed without you having to remove parts. We'll also be looking at the tools available to you, highlighting important information in the work carts. As well as showing you how to remove the valve and valve cage. The next part contains a summary of important safety aspects. Finally, you'll be shown how to perform checks and cleaning work. Part 1 will finish with measuring and crack testing. In part 2, we'll be showing you how to overhaul valve cones, valve seats and cage seats. This video film is thought as a supplementation of written pieces of information of the technical documentation. That is, the operation instructions and the working instructions. It is no substitute for this written information. We shall use this symbol as a reference to the relevant working cards. Please read them carefully prior to starting on the job. Safety first. Always remember this principle when doing maintenance work. This symbol is used to mark significant notes on how injury to persons or damage to components can be avoided. We are convinced that this video film will be of valuable assistance to you in doing your responsible job. We wish you every success. Valves and valve seats are precision components designed to control the gas change in diesel engines. They have the following tasks. Inlet valves allow the cylinder to be filled with compressed fresh air. Exhaust valves allow the hot exhaust gases to escape. The piston supports air entry and pushes the combusted cylinder contents into the exhaust manifold. During the compression and work phase, the valves must be absolutely tight. At the end of the fourth stroke, exhaust stroke, the inlet and exhaust valves are both open. This valve overlap phase ensures complete scavenging and component cooling. Valves can be made entirely of nymonic, that is nickel and chrome, or of heat resistant steel with wearproof armoring. This kind of armoring is usually called stellite or colmenoy. It is also used for valve seat rings. In medium speed engines, each cylinder head has two inlet and two exhaust valves. Valve motion is controlled by the camshaft, the push rods and the rocker arms. The valve springs resist the opening of the valves and maintain valve train tension during opening and closing. The valve guides ensure that the valves are centered on the valve seat and that a part of the heat can be dissipated to the cylinder head. Valve cages are designed to make maintenance work easier. They allow valves to be removed without dismantling the cylinder heads. Valves are subject to considerable stresses. Firstly, to mechanical loading from the many millions of contacts in the valve seat and the sealing effect they provide at firing pressures of up to 200 bar. Secondly, they are subject to high thermal loading. 
the maximum temperatures generated in the combustion chamber can reach around 2,000 degrees Celsius. They can be as high as 500 degrees at the exhaust valve plate and as high as 375 degrees at the valve seat. Thirdly, valves have to withstand chemical reactions. These come from aggressive fuels, gases and deposits. A key factor is how much sulphur, vanadium and sodium are present in the fuel. In overall terms, exhaust valves are subject to higher loads than inlet valves. They therefore need to be checked at more frequent intervals. While the engine is running, the certainty with which problems with valves and neighbouring components can be detected is limited. One indicator of a fault having occurred can be the exhaust gas temperatures. If a comparison with the mean values shows that one value is higher than in the neighbouring cylinders, this could point to leaks or blow-by in the exhaust valve. The valve clearance is also an important indicator of the state of the valves. If the clearance has increased, this could point either to deposits on the valve seat or to wear at the front face of the valve stem. If the clearance has decreased, this might be the result of wear at the valve seat. Please also check for any changes to the gap between the top edge of the adjusting screw and that of the lock nut. The values ascertained should be noted down carefully so that they can, if necessary, be compared with earlier readings. A change in the speed of valve rotation can also be indicative. If it has dropped, this points to either the rotator or the thrust bearing not functioning correctly. Damage to the valve stem or valve guide can likewise hinder rotation. Here again, it is worthwhile making a note of the values ascertained. Valve rotation and valve clearance should be checked approximately every 1500 hours. You will not have to remove any components to do this. The only way to obtain a complete overview of the condition of valves, seat rings and valve cages is to have them looked at properly once they have been dismantled. These checks should be carried out on individual valves at relatively frequent intervals. Conducting regular checks and performing overhauling work will ensure trouble-free engine operation and long component lifetimes. All exhaust and inlet valves should be overhauled at longer intervals. This is very demanding work. It should therefore be carried out very carefully. We'll now be showing you how to perform this checking and adjusting work in some detail. You should note the following. Inlet valves are equipped with valve rotators, which are known as rotocaps. Valve rotation can be seen in the bump on the rotocap. Rotocaps are turned by the opening of the valves. The valve must complete at least one rotation per minute in a gradual and even motion. The rate of motion depends on stroke and speed. Exhaust valves, on the other hand, have propellers formed on the stem and a thrust bearing above the spring plate. The valves are rotated by the flow of gas. This helps prevent the higher temperatures always affecting the same areas, which prevents valve deformation and the formation of deposits on the valve seat. Exhaust valve rotation is observed via the bore in the thrust bearing cover. Here again, the valve should complete at least one rotation per minute. At rated output, the speed of rotation must be higher than shown here. It depends on engine load and speed. If your checks produce unsatisfactory results, you should replace the rotator or the thrust bearing. You do not need to remove the cylinder head to do this. If this proves unsuccessful, the affected valves should be removed as quickly as possible. Before the valve clearance can be checked and, if necessary, readjusted, the engine must be allowed to cool down. This waiting time is needed to ensure even component temperatures. 
The running gear of the relevant cylinder must be turned to the ignition TDC position so as to ensure that all valves are closed and the load is removed from the rocker arm. Use a feeler gauge to check the clearance between the valve stem and the ball cup. Raise the driving lever and ensure that the thrust piece is not distorted. Excessive clearance means that valve opening is being delayed. This can result in damage to the cam. Insufficient clearance means that the valve may not be closing correctly. To correct the valve clearance, you must first loosen and then screw back the adjusting screw. Then place the feeler gauge on the valve stem and tighten the screw until the gauge shows no clearance. Then re-tighten the lock nut and recheck the clearance. Maintenance work on valves involves removing heavy components and positioning them so that work can be carried out effectively. You have a number of proven tools available to help you do this. The most important ones are the suspension device and the turning device for the cylinder head, the extractor for the valve cage and the valve spring tensioner. Nearly all this work must be performed in a specific sequence and in a specific way. You'll find the relevant written instructions in the work cards. Please read these detailed work cards carefully. All valves have to be overhauled at longer intervals. To do this, the cylinder heads have to be removed. This is not necessary with the 5864 engine because all the valves are arranged in valve cages. The valves and the valve cages are dismantled in the turning device. Remove the adapter plates and fasten them to either side of the cylinder head. Place the cylinder head with the square on the gear side in the turning device and fasten it using the fastening bow. Only screw on hand tight on the opposite side. Once you have removed the suspension device, turn the cylinder head 90 degrees. The locking lever must be folded up. The gear is self-locking. You should nonetheless always engage the locking lever in a groove in the clamping head. First of all, check the seal of the water space to the backing ring and the sealing surface to the top land ring or the cylinder liner. Now examine the combustion chamber side for contamination and coking. We'll be looking at these checks in detail later. We'll also be showing you comparative images for assessing your findings. Before you remove the valve cone, check that the cone pieces are properly seated. The chamfer beneath the journal and a part of the cylindrical projection must be visible. Now you can attach the valve spring tensioner. This is prevented from turning using the socket wrench or a Tommy bar. Clamp the tensioner by rotating the spindle clockwise. For your own safety, make sure you never stand directly behind the tensioner. Continue until the cone pieces come away. Remove them. Screw the spindle back until the tensioner is loose and can be removed. You can now remove the valve springs and the tensioner, or, if you are removing an exhaust valve, the thrust bearing. You should take this opportunity to perform an initial visual inspection of the components. 
Check the rotator or the thrust bearing to see whether it will move and check the valve springs to see if they are damaged. You can then push the valve cone back and remove it from the opposite side. Later on we'll be looking at the difficulties you might encounter. One important point, always mark the valve cone with cylinder number, type of valve and side. If the valve is not being overhauled, it must be refitted in the correct valve guide after it has been checked. Also, mark the relevant rotators. Before removing a valve cage, the cylinder head must be in the vertical position. Unscrew the three hexagon nuts and then take off the flange. Remove the ring seal in the valve guide using a suitable tool. Now attach the extractor with the hydraulic cylinder. Please note, never remove the valve cage using a rope and lifting tackle. Always use the proper tool. Screw in the extractor sleeve as far as it will go. Now screw down the hexagon nut on the hydraulic cylinder. Attach and secure the hydraulic hose. Now you can pull up the valve cage using the hydraulic tensioner. Later on we'll be looking at the difficulties you might encounter. Once the first O-ring is visible, the valve cage can be pulled out. We recommend you place it in the cleaning tank. Please note, the valve cage is filled with cooling water. You should therefore set down the cage with the bore facing downwards and allow the remaining water to drain out. Then place it next to the relevant valve and mark it as well. Before moving on to a detailed check of the components, we'd like to take a brief look at some of the problems you might encounter when removing valves and valve cages. you may find you are unable to remove the valve cone. Unlike in the case shown here, the cause could be lacquering of the valve stem. Another cause could be burring in the clamping cone groove. Lacquering and debris from the cone pieces can be removed using emery cloth, but for burring in the clamping cone groove, you will need a grindstone. If a burr has developed, it must be removed using a portable grinder. In this case, the valve will have to be scrapped. If this doesn't help, you will have to resort to a copper bolt and hammer. You should then examine the valve and valve guide critically to see if they can still be used. You may also find that, even exerting maximum pressure, the valve cage cannot be pulled from the valve housing. In this case, you should spray a penetrating oil onto any accessible contact faces and into the inspection bore, and allow it to act for a while. Should a further attempt fail, we strongly advise you to call one of our service bases for support. Before we continue with our checks and measurements, we'd just like to re-summarise a number of safety rules. Please follow these rules. This is in your own interest and that of the operational safety of your engine. Check regularly for valve rotation. Look out for changes in the exhaust gas temperatures and firing pressures of individual cylinders. They could point to valve damage. 
check valve clearances regularly. Use the correct tools when carrying out maintenance work and make sure they are in faultless condition. Make sure the cylinder head is correctly fastened in the turning device and that the locking lever is in the correct position. When tightening and loosening valve springs, make sure you are not standing directly in the spring axis. If the thread spindle breaks, your body will take the full brunt of the spring tension. After you have removed them, make sure you examine all the components thoroughly. Once you've completed these initial checks, thoroughly clean the components and recheck where necessary. Based on your findings, you will then decide which components are still serviceable and how much overhauling work is required. To give you a clearer picture of the form damage can take, we'll be showing you a number of damaged components. Please note that these components have been taken from a number of different engines and were operating under differing conditions. We use the following symbols to indicate findings. Component OK can be reused. Condition questionable, further inspections necessary. Reconditioning required. Scrap, replace component. Check the general condition of the cylinder head, as well as the state of, and the deposits on, the gas ducts and valve housings. You should also clear up the following points. Are the sealing surfaces to the backing ring and the combustion chamber free of damage, caused by blow-by, for example, or by mechanical impact? Are the sealing rings damaged or distorted? Are there any cracks in the O-ring grooves? Is the water space free from corrosion, deposits and contamination? Corrosion damage on the water side can be caused by insufficient cooling water treatment. Are the amounts of contamination and deposits on the combustion chamber side normal? You should also check that the coking around the injection valve is not beyond the normal. Coking is an indication that the fuel or injection system is malfunctioning. You should also check for contamination and deposits in the valve housing. You can check whether the thrust bearing of the exhaust valve is functioning correctly by turning it. You should not be able to detect any resistance. If in doubt, dismantle the thrust bearing and also check the insides. Tracks and balls must be damage free. Inlet valve rotators can only be dismantled once the retaining ring has been removed. Clean the disc spring and thrust collar and check for signs of wear. Components showing signs of fretting or ball impressions and broken springs should be replaced. There are two wear sets available in such cases, each covering different components. You'll find the order numbers in the spare parts catalogue. When assembling, please remember that the balls must lie at the highest point of the ball pockets and hence all lie in the same direction. Do not fill the rotator with grease. Instead, lubricate it once it has been assembled.
valve springs must be undamaged. They should not exhibit any seizing marks at the contact faces or any signs of wear at the windings. Valve cones should be checked particularly carefully. The best place to begin is at the front end. It should not exhibit any signs of wear. Typical for stuck valves are sickle-shaped impressions formed by jammed thrust pieces. The cone pieces and the corresponding sections of the valve stem are usually in good condition. Fretting corrosion marks or traces of wear can, however, occur from time to time. They must not exceed narrow limits. Traces of corrosion on the valve stems are usually found in the lower regions of the valve guide. They occur depending on the fuel used and, being nothing more than discoloration, are harmless. They can, however, be critical if they lead to a significant reduction in diameter or to point or nest-like blemishes. You should particularly check the transition from valve stem to valve seat for traces of high or low temperature corrosion, as well as for cracking. Cracking can be the result of corrosion, but also of faulty remachining. The valve seat and armoring must both be free from deep scoring and crack free. Please make sure the wear limits are not exceeded. Blow through and incipient blow through are both reasons for replacing the valve. Check the underface of the valve plate for deposits, signs of corrosion, for cracks and deformations. Finally, check the inside and outside of the valve cage for deposits and traces of corrosion. The valve guides must also be checked for traces of corrosion and wear. As a rule, the bore is mirror smooth. Check the condition of the sealing rings. They should always be replaced. You should pay particular attention to the seating surfaces of valve seat rings and valve cages. They must be in remachinable condition. Leaks or blow through on valve cages can be the result of insufficient cleaning, incorrectly tightened bolts or faulty remachining. The next stage involves thorough cleaning of all the components. Use suitable cleaning fluids and wire brushes or scrapers. Do not, under any circumstances, use a de-slagging hammer. Tools such as these can cause critical damage. You'll find it helpful if you spray or brush on a cleansing agent first. Watch out for areas of corrosion and cracks, which may be hidden under deposits. The valve housings in the cylinder head are best cleaned with a sheet metal or triangular scraper and then rubbed down with a felt plate and cloth. The transition between valve housing and outlet duct must be clean and free from loose particles. This is important to ensure that no residues can fall onto the cage seat when the valve cage is being inserted. With the cylinder head attached, the collecting pans included in the tools must be put in place prior to cleaning the valve housing. Please note, in this case, rotating wire brushes should not be used, owing to the risk of pieces of wire breaking off. You can use these tools, however, when performing work in the turning device.
The cleaned components now have to be measured and checked for cracking. These checks and the information obtained from the visual inspections help you to reach a final decision on component reusability and on how much overhaul work will be required. Measure the extent to which the inside diameter of the valve guide has changed. You must also check the diameter of the valve stem in the valve guide area. The difference must not exceed the maximum clearance. You'll find the limit values in the operating manual. Measure the thickness of the valve plate at several points on a circle of two-thirds of the diameter. Compare the values with those of a new valve plate. It is essential that you take account of areas of corrosion on the underside of the valve plate and of any remachining the seat may require. The loss of thickness may not exceed 10%. The loss of thickness on the underside of the plate may not exceed 3 mm, including possible deformations. Narrow limits also apply to the diameter of the valve plate and the width of the seating surfaces at the valve and seat ring. You'll find these limits listed in the relevant work cards. If these limits cannot be adhered to, the components must be replaced. The seating surfaces of valves, valve seat rings and valve cages are divided into three categories depending on the condition they are in. In the first case, the seating surfaces exhibit only slight wear, modest scoring and an even wear pattern. Components in this condition can continue to be used without remachining. If they have already been removed, an overhaul is recommended. In the second case, the seating surfaces exhibit deeper corrosion or impact scoring or clearly visible wear. The remachining limits have nonetheless not yet been exceeded. In this case, the seating surfaces must be remachined. This also applies to components which have already clocked up approximately 12,000 hours of service, regardless of seating surface findings. Components in Category 3 cannot be remachined. These components must definitely be replaced. In these cases, the seating surfaces exhibit severe damage, such as incipient blow-through, serious wear or cracking. Cracks in the armoring can have their origin in faulty material or in excessive mechanical or thermal loading. Blow-through is the result of faulty remachining and can be caused by faulty rotators or deposits or scoring on the valve seat. Impact scoring is more frequent if the rotators are not fully functional. The same standards apply to the seating surfaces of both the valve cage and the cylinder head. The seating surfaces in the cylinder head must always be reground or re-milled. Crack testing is another important part of these detailed checks. It must be performed on the seating surfaces of the valve cone and valve seat ring and in the fillet of the valve. In exhaust valves, the propeller area must also be checked. The seating surfaces in the cylinder head and at the valve cage must also be included in this check. These checks must include liquid penetration methods, if necessary complemented by a magnetic crack test. Components shown to have cracks must be replaced. It is only once the components have been cleaned and checked that actual overhaul work can begin. We'll be looking at this in detail in a second video. The seating surfaces of the valve cone and seat rings, as well as those of the cylinder head and valve cage seat rings, are meant to be remachined. The valve cone and valve seats can be remachined using grinding machines. To replace the valve seat ring in the cylinder, you'll need a welding torch for shrinking and dry ice for fitting a new seat ring. 
The seating surfaces of the cage in the cylinder head must be reground or remilled by hand. Valve cages can either be reground by hand or remachined on a lathe. Valve guides, here we see the inner diameter being measured, can be replaced using the tools supplied as standard with the engine. Cast components, such as the cylinder head and the valve cage, can be re-welded in Hamburg using a tried and tested method. Hamburg will also carry out replacement of the seat ring of valve cages. Particularly when carrying out work of this kind, beware of dubious workshops and pirated components. We hope that having watched this video, you are now equipped to carry out the checks which will enable you to assess components. We've devoted a relatively large amount of time to this subject because the knowledge gained here is vital for your initial decisions and for the success of any overhaul work you perform. We'll be showing you the overhaul work which you yourself can carry out on inlet and exhaust valves in our second video, which we've entitled Overhauling Inlet and Exhaust Valves. Well, I think this video film appropriately illustrates the maintenance jobs to be done. And please remember, the work carts included in the technical documentation contain more technical details. You should take recourse to this source of information whenever you have to do maintenance work. Should you encounter difficulties, please don't hesitate to contact our diesel team in Augsburg or Hamburg or one of our service bases all over the world. We wish you good success with your work and trouble-free operation of our MAN B&W diesel engines at all times.